Good evening and welcome church family and any of you who are viewing for the very first time. It's our joy that you've all decided to join us on this Good Friday evening service via the web. Doubtless it's clear to all of us that this has been a holy week like none other in church history. And though we are physically apart out of love for our neighbor as a result of this crisis, we believe that we are united by God's Spirit, for He is omnipresent, that is, He is everywhere present. We also believe that God is the same, unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And where God's word is heard, God's voice is heard. God is speaking. And so that's our prayer, that the Lord will speak to each of us tonight as we spend this time reflecting upon the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The focus on Good Friday traditionally is upon the crucifixion, its meaning, its significance. But the crucifixion should never be considered apart from the empty tomb, the resurrection. Together they comprise the core, the heart of the Christian message. Nevertheless, tonight we will be focusing primarily on the cross, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll do so through songs of praise, through extended readings from Scripture, and lastly through a brief exposition from Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8. Join me now as I pray and we begin our time together. Lord in heaven, meet us, dear God, in the person of your Spirit, wherever we are, Lord, and do a work in each of our hearts, we pray. Be magnified now in Christ's name. Oh 
out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Aramaic is Golgotha there they crucified him and with him two others one on either side and Jesus between them Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross it read Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Alas, and did my 
my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for sin? Oh. 
spread His praise from shore to shore. How we love and ever love and change and ever, never more. How we watch us for His love once died to call Him all His own. How for them He interceded. do
My servant shall prosper. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. 
while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows or demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us. The crucifixion of Jesus, an indescribable and horrible death, has been viewed from various angles. And one point that the Bible repeatedly makes is that the crucifixion is ultimately the plan of God the Father. It was designed by God the Father to reconcile rebellious humanity to himself, to make peace. And as I just read from the book of Romans, Paul there essentially says that the cross is the greatest expression of God's love for humanity. It is an act of love by both the Father and the Son. In the scriptures, the essence of love is not primarily what we feel. It is a selfless act of giving. And in the crucifixion of Jesus, both God the Father and God the Son love in this way. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, speaking there of the Father, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. The crucifixion of Jesus is an act of love a self-giving love of both the Father and the Son, which is applied then by the Holy Spirit. And in the cross, therefore, we have the Trinitarian work of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This love, the love of God in the, in the cross of Jesus, 
is the foundation of Christian hope. Christian hope is, is not a, a, of uncertainty. Christian hope looks forward. It is a full assurance that what God has promised us in his future, that is salvation at the final judgment, participation in the resurrection, in the new heavens and the new earth, all this and more, that what God has promised us in the future will be sure to be fulfilled. But why? Why should we trust God's promises about tomorrow? Why should we believe in the resurrection of the dead, in the new heavens and the new earth? Well, Paul would say, look back. To have for hope as you look forward, look back, look back at the cross of what God has already done for us, what God has already given. How could God not love you in the present? Now that he has made you his child by giving his only begotten son for you, how could he lie to you about the future, you see, if what he's already done for you is the greatest expression of his love? And so what Paul does in both Romans 5 and Romans 8, where I read, is he argues from the greater to the lesser. After all, what did the crucifixion, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus achieve? Well, Paul summed it up this way in Romans 5. He says, we were reconciled, made right, reconciled to God by the death of his son when? While we were still his enemies. It's fair to ask, why so? Why was the cross necessary? What is the the question behind that question? It is, what is the narrative that gives to the cross and the empty tomb its intended meaning. How should we understand it? Well, the Bible tells us that God is a loving creator who has given to humanity all that we needed and created a deep intimacy in fellowship with humanity. But human beings have rejected God. We chose autonomy. We chose self-rule. We chose to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong and have marginalized God. We're making God in our image. And in God's moral universe, this has consequences. We are alienated from God's scripture says, your sins have separated you from your God. We have guilt and face condemnation. Condemnation, the scripture says, the wages of sin is death. And we are powerless to bridge this gap, to close it, because our entire human nature has been affected. Scripture says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. And so right in the middle of the Bible, right in the middle of this narrative, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, what we have is God coming into his creation. And there he took upon himself the full force of his just wrath, For our sins. We put it this way. In Christ, God the Father paid the full penalty penalty for our disobedience himself. And so that's the meaning when Jesus cried, Tetelestai, it is finished. That is to say, the work of redemption, the payment of the full just just wrath that we deserve had been made in full. And what that means, my friends and beloved, to remind you here at Good Friday, is that your salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, reconciliation with God is not a matter of human potential, of human ability. It's not a matter of human effort. It is not a matter of our love lifting us up to God. It's a matter of God's love coming down to us in His Son, in our brokenness. It is about God's love coming to us in the person of His Son to carry out what we needed, and that is to live a righteous life and to be rescued from our guilt and condemnation. And so Paul says, do you doubt God's love? Are you unsure about the future? Look back, he says, look back at the cross and the empty tomb and be assured of the future and have hope in the presence. My friends, this is why the gospel means good news. It is not advice. The gospel is an announcement of what God has done, of what God has achieved through his son. And he invites us all to receive the benefits of his work by faith and by faith alone 
to receive such things as the forgiveness of our sins, justification, that is declared not righteous before God, to be sanctified or set apart for Him, adoption, to belong to the eternal family, to be given a new life, and to be given the promise of a future bodily resurrection and a share in what God is doing now in this world, in this age, and a share, our portion, and what He's going to do in the age to come. And this is all, all offered to us by faith. We contribute nothing at all. That's why it's good news. It's not advice. It's not a call to do anything or try harder. It's a pronouncement, uh, an invitation to trust Him. Scripture says, as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. But the human heart despite the comforts of the gospel, struggles, especially at times like this, uh, troubling times like this, is this bond between God and me, is this breakable? Is there anything that would change the way God looks at me? Could I do something to break this bond? And so in answer to that in Romans chapter 8, the last portion that I read, Paul hurls up into the air, as it were, these five unanswerable questions. Each of them are like steps in a staircase, taking us higher and higher and higher. The first one is this. If God is for us in Christ, yes, who can be against us? Well, we do have formidable enemies, do we not? The world, the flesh, and the devil. There are struggles in the Christian life. Persecution is a reality. Martyrdom is a reality. It wasn't only a reality in the first century, in the time of Paul. It's even a greater reality today. But what Paul means is, is that ultimately, even that cannot prevail against us. That is to say, nothing can alter the work of God that he has promised he will achieve for us and in us through his Son. This work is something Paul had summed up in the verses just before I read Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that we might be, the, or he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Then Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who can change the purposes of God? No one. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, question two, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Again, Paul argues from the greater to the lesser. What he says in essence to you and me is this. If God has given already what is most costly to him, himself, his own son, why would he withhold what believers need to persevere in the faith, to endure in the faith, and to arrive safely in his kingdom? Third question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, the devil may point out the very worst that you and I have ever committed. He may point it out standing before the, the bar of God, but he asks, who shall bring a charge, you see, against God's elect? This only leads to the next question. Who is there to condemn? Who has the right to condemn us for our sins? Why, he says, Jesus Christ, the very one who died for us, is the one who will judge. And he is seated at the right hand of God right now, the Father in heaven, and he is there interceding for us. That is, by his presence there as our sacrifice and our payment, he is interceding on our behalf. And so this leads Paul to the final question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In verse 35, he offers seven possibilities, all realities that were being experienced in the first century and have been down through the centuries. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, we may add, or pandemic? 
And he says, as it is written, and he quotes from the Psalms, for, our, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. What is the answer to this question? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall any of these things, and Paul doesn't mean to exhaust it, can anything separate us from the love of God? Can everything, anything change the way God sees us as his beloved children? His answer is a resounding no. Verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him. Through him, Christ, who loved us. And there he puts it in the past tense to emphasize the work of the cross, which we are meditating upon tonight. And then he comes then to that final sense of assurance. He says in verse 38, For I am sure, or I am convinced, and here he uses uh, the Greek perfect tense, I am and remain convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else you may find in the creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The climax, five unanswerable questions regarding God's love. A love that Paul says was supremely vindicated and demonstrated, seen on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Five unanswerable questions designed for one end, to assure you and me, to convince you to the degree that Paul is convinced there is nothing, if you are a Christian, that could ever in any way break you away from the love of God that there's nothing that could change the way God views you and sees you through the lens of his son as his own very son and beloved child. At this moment, beloved, it's a strange time. We are surrounded by uncertainty. Everything feels like shifting sand underneath us. We're surrounded by tragedy. Some of us have been touched by tragedy. Some of you will yet be touched by tragedy. God's promise is not that his people will never be touched by suffering. No, indeed, all of us must, must pass through a door, and over that door is the label death. All of us must pass through that, but not even that, says Paul, will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We all need an answer for death. We all need an answer for tragedy and pain in this life. And Paul says, look to the cross and the empty tomb, and there you see and receive the love of God. Reflecting on the, on the cross then should be enough to convince each of us of his unchanging love, his unflinching love. Have you received him let me ask you, have you come to him in, in faith? May God minister to your heart and cause you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to take upon himself the full measure of what you deserve for your sins and out of love God gave him, out of love he gave himself, out of love he was raised from the dead to grant you the assurance of the forgiveness of your sins. The Apostle John would later write, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but he first loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Lord, give understanding, give a deep and profound understanding of the love of the cross to each of us who are listening here tonight. And for some of us, Lord, for the first time, lead us to faith in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure 
How great the pain of searing love. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mother song ends with the same degree of conviction as Paul when he says, for I am convinced. For this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Do you know that? I hope you do. If not, we invite you to continue to consider the gospel message, especially those of you perhaps who listened tonight for the very first time. Uh, checking in with us, please come back on, on Easter Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and then again at 11.15, 11.30, we will post what we live stream at 9 a.m. and listen to the message of the empty tomb. If you need other resources, we'd like to point you to our website, and there you will find some resources. You will come there to uh, a page that I believe is being posted right now there for you, welcome.graceforus.org. And there we will find a link to an online Bible. If you, if you need a Bible, have never read the Bible directly, uh, a further explanation of the good news. And then also you'll see there a prayer link. There you can follow that link and let us know how we can be praying 
for you. Please feel free to contact us. You'll also find our, our general email there at the homepage of our website. Well, it's been a joy to be here with a few to present this ministry to you. We hope and trust that God has ministered to you. Seek Him with all your heart. When you seek me with all your heart, says God, you will find me. Lord, be with us the remaining time of this weekend. Give us a deepening understanding, Lord, of what is truly uh, valuable in life, what our treasure should truly be. And meet with us, dear God, and every other church, Lord, across this globe that is whatever, Lord, they are streaming live, Lord, or recording the Easter message, Lord, wherever the gospel is truly preached, Lord, come and bless your word, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. May God richly bless you. So long. Thank you.